glad to welcome members of the class, faculty, guests, and so on. This is a very special occasion. I'll just make an announcement or two. Wayne was unable to be here, but I think you all know he's programmed for us next week and the small group discussion, and I think you've already met the people who are in the assistants who are in charge of the small group discussions, and so if you were not here last time, you might check with your own people about that, uh, the next discussion of sexism at that time. I just want to remind you from 5 to 7 on this Sunday at the, uh, uh, what do they call it, the basement of the Y, uh, I can't think of the name of it. Thank you. The Pakistan Nigerian dinner, which is being given to help finance the geography field trip to Pakistan this summer. Okay. Are there any other announcements that I should make? If not, I'm going to talk then the uh, talk over to Dr. Dennis Brutus, who comes to us from South Africa from which he has been exiled, as you all know, and from London. Two years ago, he was in China. Uh, he has been just about everywhere, and at the moment, he is permanently at Northwestern, but he's visiting professor at Texas, and we were able to have him alight at Ames for this very special week for us, Black Awareness Week, and so on, the Third World Cultures is helping to sponsor his visit. And I think since I have announced his coming before, I'm not going to take your time with further introduction. I'll simply introduce Dr. Beaver. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, John. Um, you sure I have to stand up here? I guess for the mic. I don't know if I've intimidated you, but there's so many empty seats up front and so many filled seats at the back. It kind of uh, cuts off communication when you're so far away. Um, I was also told that I didn't have to have a topic for this morning, which is the kind of misleading thing people tell you when they lure you into a situation and then you find you're in trouble afterwards. Uh, it may be useful if I touched on three things which seem to me of interest at the moment and that would be fairly brief and it would allow you to introduce any other topic you wish to introduce if you found the three I introduced insufficiently interesting. If they don't stimulate you, you may have others of your own. But I thought I would touch on three things which uh, may be helpful. One is to talk about a course I'm teaching in Texas at the moment. Uh, which is called the Racist Experiment and is an examination of the quite unique uh, South African situation. Uh, really, there is nothing in the world like it at the present time. And I want to talk about that very briefly and indicate how we approach it. Then I thought I would talk about what seems to me a very significant development in black awareness in this country, and uh, some of you may have heard me on this before, so I shan't be very long. It won't be an extended comment, just a kind of sketch of what I think is happening. And then a rather boring area for me, because I've done it so often, but perhaps not so boring for you, uh, some of my own experiences in a racist situation, insofar as I think they bring out some of the elements of what racism is about. So if we took those three, it seems to me we would have enough. The course, the modern racist experiment uh, looks at two things that are happening in South Africa. One, the apparatus by which racism is imposed on a society, and the ideology of that particular form of racism. 
The white South Africans who constitute one-sixth of the total population of the country and in whose hands all political power is concentrated, no blacks have the vote, no blacks are allowed to vote either for a black or even for a white uh, to represent them in government. We have an entirely white parliament and the blacks have neither the right to elect nor to be elected. What's important about white South Africa is that it believes that it has discovered the perfect solution to all race problems in the world. And they claim that their solution is the model which in time the rest of the world is going to follow. Uh, in 1972, for instance, when South Africa was expelled from the Olympic Games, uh, excluded from world sport, the Prime Minister said that uh, this is a passing aberration. The world is punishing us because it does not understand what we are doing. But our solution to the race problem, the way we treat our black, is the way the rest of the world will follow in the future. So what is this way? Well, it consists of a number of elements, one of which you probably know. A policy called apartheid. And apartheid simply means apartness, keeping people apart. And the argument is that black and white can never live peacefully together and therefore you have to keep them apart by law and you have a whole range of laws which force black and white into separate compartments but allied with the system of apartheid which keeps them separate is a system of education which is designed not merely to preserve the system <coughs> but to persuade people to believe that the system is the best in the world. And you have to look at the definitions of these two separate educational systems just uh, for a very rapid kind of insight. When the white system of education was uh, introduced, the Minister for Education said uh, the education for white children must prepare them for a dominant place in society. And there is a clear commitment to white domination, white supremacy. And for the blacks, there are two memorable statements. The one was the statement by the minister that the black child must be educated to understand that equality is not for him so that he will cease to aspire to the green pastures that are reserved for white South Africans. And the second one was that if you educate a black child to believe that he is equal to a white child, then you are producing frustrated blacks <coughs> because when they leave school and they enter society, they discover that they are not equal. Therefore, to ensure that you don't have frustrated blacks who suffer from ulcers and everything else, what you need is to educate them into the acceptance of their inferiority. Now, if you wanted to do some reading on this, uh, there are certain books. I might leave a reading list with you afterwards. But I recommend a book by a man called Heribert Adam called Modernizing Racial Domination, which shows how uh, the South Africans have streamlined the techniques of racial domination. You might also look at an earlier paperback published by Penguin by a man called Brian Bunting called The Rise of the South African Reich. which looks at the significant
German and Nazi and racist component in the South African apartheid ideology. Well, this is what we're looking at in my course and trying to discover the degree to which this clearly defined an extremely sophisticated process of racial indoctrination, how far it is succeeding, this experiment in modern racism. And it raises all kinds of complex issues. For instance, the, the fact that we've reached the stage in South Africa now where in dealing with the blacks, the white government, the minority white government, has committed itself to a policy of virtual genocide in relation to the blacks who are no longer useful in the economy. Uh, that's one aspect. We also look at the significance of the United States' involvement in the apartheid system, the way in which uh, more than 300 American corporations function in South Africa within the system, the way in which uh, uh, Secretary of State Henry Kissinger has recommended public support for blacks, uh, private support for the whites, increased investment, increased military support, increased political support. So we look at the implications of the South African experiment, both in terms of how far it works there, but also what its implications are for people in the United States. Well, there's so much for that. It seems to me that all I wanted to do was give you an idea of where we're at, and hopefully you want to raise questions uh, flowing from that. Then if we look at the United States, clearly the relationship of the United States to South Africa is one area which interests me very greatly. But uh, one looks at certain aspects of the American society which in curious ways are echoes of what is happening in South Africa. And this in itself is a, is a very revealing study, but it is not one I attempt in my course. I talk only about the interrelation. Um, one of the things happening in South Africa is that the blacks who are educated into the belief of racial inferiority, from their ranks are selected the blacks who will run certain governmental institutions on behalf of the racist minority. And these turn out to be the brightest and the best of the blacks. They are, some of them, put into a very special system uh, called Bantustans, mini-states within the state, they administer it, and now we've reached the point where these men are engaged in recruiting blacks to join the army to defend white supremacy. So that you can reach a stage where, uh, by a process of indoctrination, by co-optation from the ranks of the oppressed, you can find the allies who themselves have a stake, however minor, in the system of oppression and are then willing to be part of the defenders of the system. And this seems to me to have all kinds of interesting implications uh, in the United States. There are other aspects, of course, the kind of process where one thinks that problems can be cured by, by cosmetic treatment a little touch of makeup here and there, or, or the kind of Jesse Jackson approach where he says there's nothing wrong with the system as long as we can get a piece of the action. That's all we're after. I find in Chicago now a quite horrifying development where black businessmen are saying if white businessmen in America can go to Africa and rip off the Africans, 
it should be even easier for us to do it because after all we're also Africans or we're Afro-Americans and it would be more acceptable if we were going in there. We find white businesses in this country who are setting up black fronts of little minor SBAs, if you like, small businesses uh, run by blacks to conduct their investment in Africa. So there are all kinds of ways in which when one looks at the American situation as I do with, I guess, a, a kind of superficial external view rather than someone involved within the process myself, in which I find uh, uh, things that are very instructive. But I want to touch on what seems to me the most exciting uh, debate uh, in black awareness, the area of black awareness in America at the present time, and I want to make it very specific. Last year, I was in Dar es Salaam for the sixth Pan-African Congress. Uh, the first one was held in 1909, a long time ago. The, one, the fifth was held in 1945 in Manchester. There were five, all held outside Africa. And at the time of the first one, there were only two independent states in Africa, or for that matter, pseudo-independent states, Ethiopia and Liberia. When they met in Dar es Salaam last year, there were 42 independent states. So one has come a long way. But again, perhaps you should qualify that and talk of a pseudo-independent as well as independent. But the largest delegation there was 250 black Americans, Afro-Americans, who flew in on a chartered plane and came there with great excitement, returning to the motherland, talking about this is the year of black unity, black freedom. And they were very enthusiastic. And the Africans, on the other hand, were really very cool about all this. And they said, look, here in Africa, we understand very clearly that you can shout black unity and black brotherhood, but my own black brother may be exploiting me. My own black brother, if he is in power, may be oppressing me. So that getting blacks together is only part of the solution. There may be other problems as well. And one may have to distinguish between a black versus white struggle, where the whites are all the oppressors and the blacks are all the oppressed, when you get into a context where everybody's black, but there's still a lot of oppression and a lot of exploitation. And that for us, the lines of the struggle are drawn differently. They are drawn in terms of two classes, those who exploit and those who are exploited, and those who are oppressed and those who are the oppressors. And from that, we move to an understanding which in fact was declared as long ago as 1909 that Pan-Africanism is the unity of the peoples of Africa in Africa and outside in the diaspora but it is also the unity of the African oppressed with the oppressed everywhere else in the world whether in the Middle East in the form of Palestinians whether in Indochina, in the form of Vietnamese or Cambodians, our struggle is part of a global struggle where the lines are drawn, not on color, but between oppressed and oppressor. Now this has generated into a tremendously exciting and significant debate in America, with people taking sides on this issue on whether class or color or race economic issues are the dominant one. And I think it's worth mentioning this and you may want to explore it. I've already talked too long, but I'm just going to run into my third area in which there are questions. Uh, I choose <coughs> two things in South Africa, one relating to myself and one relating to uh, a specific event. 
When the whites came to South Africa in 1652, that's more than 300 years ago, to set up a little uh, refreshment station there, water and fresh meat and vegetables on their way to the East Indies in the silk and spice trade. They encouraged marriage between the blacks and the whites because they decided that was one way to make friends. And the first marriage was solemnized in the little fort they built at Cape Town by the commander-in-chief of the garrison. And from 1652 until 1952, straight 300 years, marriage between black and white was permitted. But then they discovered that uh, this was very alarming because the, the blacks were multiplying more rapidly. They were five, six of the population. And uh, so, well, the, one of the reasons, there were others, of course, but they passed an act called the Immorality Act. And immorality had nothing to do with sex unless you were of different colors. For a white man or white woman to marry someone of the other color, after 300 years of this, became a crime called immorality. And if you slept with your wife who happened to be of another color, this was a crime, immorality. And indeed, if you, made, if you winked at a girl of the other color at the bus stop, and she reported you to the cops, you could be charged with immorality. You can see how our words can change in context. But you have in South Africa now one-sixth population, which is uh, out of about 24 million, which is white, and five-sixths, which is called non-white. And those of you who saw the film the other day will remember all the signs saying whites only, non-whites only. I find in America still an alarming tendency to subdivide the non-whites into pure blacks or pitch blacks and half blacks or browns and so on. One of the things that's happened of great importance in South Africa is the recognition by all the non-whites that they are all oppressed, that the degrees of oppression may vary because the government is smart enough to attempt to split them into sections and give one section somewhat more privileged than the other. So the, there are attempts by the state to fragment the non-whites or the oppressed. The oppressed in turn make very conscious efforts to coordinate their struggle and to stress the commonness of their predicament and the leaders in this have been black students establishing an organization called SASO, South African Student Organization, which has led what is called the Black Consciousness Movement to demolish the barriers between the various sections. Uh, I am, of course, part of the oppressed, part of the non-whites, and what happened to me seems to me useful just to talk about briefly. I had to teach in a school where my job was to teach black kids they were inferior to white kids. And that also means giving them an inferior syllabus. Black kids are not taught mathematics or math because what would a black kid do with it anyway? Uh, you don't learn any European history or American history or for that matter European or American geography because you don't need it and the syllabus in language is a limited one. Well, I taught students whatever I thought they ought to know, which was as much as they were getting in any white school. And so I received an order from the government saying it was a, a crime for me to teach, that the minister had decided I was a person unfit to teach young minds. Now, I don't want to get into too many things, so I'll specify this one. The order said several things. One, I could not teach in a classroom. But two, I could not teach outside the classroom. And three, I could not tutor anybody privately, not even in my home. And four, I could not enter any educational institution even to come there and work as a cleaner. You could not enter the building at all. And five, I could not write a letter 
to any educational institution because I might want to continue my studies by correspondence, something that sort. So that had to be stopped. So all these, a whole range of activities were limited, and if I did any of these, I would go to prison for three years. I became a journalist then, and then got an order which said, if you write anything and it's published, you go to prison. And the editor who publishes you goes to prison with you as well. So they sealed that up. I went on teaching in a garage, a kind of underground school for kids whose parents did not want them to be indoctrinated. And the secret police used to visit the school wearing overalls and uh, lumber jackets and things and carrying bags of tools. And they used to say, oh, we're just coming to fix the plumbing or we're just coming to fix the lights. But there's a very, very shrewd bunch of students who would warn me when the SB were around, the special branch. And as long as they didn't catch me teaching, it was all right. They did catch one woman with a piece of chalk in her hand. And so she was arrested and taken to court, and they couldn't prove that she had been teaching. But the secret police said, well, she did have a piece of chalk in her hand. And the magistrate said, right, then she must have been teaching. And she went to prison. So one has that kind of complication. Uh, because I was organizing the campaign to throw the racist body out of the Olympics, it also became a crime for me to belong to a sports organization, go to a sports meeting, watch a football match, uh, go to a movie, or go to church. All these were crimes. And when I went on doing this, and they caught me at a sports meeting, I went to a committee meeting where they were discussing the Olympics and how to keep the blacks out, although they were the best athletes in the country. And I went there to represent the blacks, though it was illegal. And when I got into the meeting, uh, out of a cupboard in the wall, two members of the secret police turned up rather like cuckoos out of a cuckoo clock and arrested me, and I was uh, taken to court and charged with the crime of attending a sports meeting. I was released on a bail bond. I escaped from the country. I got to Mozambique. The Portuguese secret police caught me there, and they said, we have a friendly arrangement with the South African secret police. They catch our fugitives, we catch their fugitives. And so I was taken back to Johannesburg and no one even knew that I was back in the country. The people in the ghetto were celebrating the fact that I had escaped. They didn't know I was right back in Johannesburg. And the only way to warn them was to attempt a second escape in public. I chose five o'clock in the afternoon when the streets were busy with two members of the secret police with me. One fatherly old man with white hair the other a young athlete. They make a good team. Both of them with guns under their armpits in sports shirts, sports trousers. And they said, look, if you move, we kill you. So just don't do anything. Uh, but I made an attempt to escape in the main street, thinking they wouldn't shoot in a crowd. Five o'clock in the afternoon. But I was wrong. They shot me in the back at such close range that the bullet went right through my body entered my back, came out of my stomach. And I was running, and I just kept on running. I felt like someone had punched me in the back, but I kept sprinting until I looked down, and I had a white shirt on, and there was this great red stain spreading on my shirt. And I realized that it would be very dumb if I ran myself to death. So I stopped. And they caught up with me and said, okay, now you march back to prison. And I marched back and uh, lost so much blood that I collapsed on the sidewalk. And I lay there for 45 minutes. And I looked up at the sky and over me was a great skyscraper, tall office block, 45 stories high, with a name on the front of it. It was the biggest mining corporation in South Africa, gold and diamonds, 
and it's called the Anglo-American Corporation. And when I lay there, uh, bleeding on the sidewalk, I thought it was appropriate that I should lie in the shadow of the Anglo-American <coughs> Corporation. Uh, I should say that I, when I saw the stain in the front of my shirt, I assumed that I had been shot from the front. You, you see, you don't think very clearly in these situations. So when I lay on the sidewalk, an ambulance came, and the men got out in their uniforms with stretchers. They came over to me, they looked at me, and they went back to their ambulance and put their stretcher away, and they drove off. And I said to the secret police, what's happening? And they said, well, that's an ambulance for white people. And uh, if they took you in it, they would lose their jobs. Uh, so I lay there on the sidewalk, and by now I was bleeding so much, I took my handkerchief and I plugged the hole in the front of my body to stop the bleeding. But I found this didn't work very well because I was still forming a pool of blood under my back. And it was only at that stage that I realized that the bullet had gone right through me, and that I had one in my back as well as in the front of my body. I don't know what this tells you about racism, except that for one thing it's irrational. One produces a series of arguments in defense of it. I hope it also tells you that one of the important components in racism is neither color nor culture, but economics. That what a great deal of racism abo is about is exploitation, and that you may well exploit your own people and uh, of your own color, of your own race, but that sometimes you can combine a race with exploitation and use the racial differences as a justification for the oppression and economic exploitation. These seem to me some of the things we ought to bear in mind in any discussion of racism and hopefully, I guess, uh, one should also realize the extent that people can be dehumanized uh, in the process of uh, discrimination, racism, how much can be done. Uh, and one can still go on appearing to be quite normal and sane and even humane while these uh, humane values are being eroded. I think there are very few people in America who uh, would not say there are racists in American society. But when you ask who are they, they would point to someone else. It's very hard to accept for yourself the possibility that you may be a racist. And indeed you may well be, but insulated uh, from the knowledge of your own racism or the degree to which your society is a racist society. It's a painful process of discovery, but I think it's a necessary process we have to go through. I'd like to stop there and see if we have any questions. I'm going to get away from the mic as well, because uh, I can see if you have any questions or comments. I don't know there's anything I omitted to say. I really wasn't going to say very much, just give you a thing to start you off. I tell you that in the last five years, 89 new laws have been passed intensifying racial repression. One would have thought that they had written all that they needed on the book, but periodically they still find loopholes and then they have to introduce new legislation. Um, in the last year, um, well, fairly recently, they passed a new law uh, which uh, made it a crime for a white, this is 
picture on a black smithy in a chest all over the place. Now, previously, you could have an old black smithy, but the chairperson would be white. And this is fairly common. But now it's become a crime for a white person to serve on the smithy like that. That's fairly new. The other very interesting one is that white students attempting to assist black students in the deprived black schools in the ghetto were trying to raise money outside South Africa to buy a textbook. And it's now become a crime for any organization in South Africa to receive money from any organization outside South Africa. And that law was only passed around about November of last year. So there are all these new complications, new subtleties being added. But the process is quite similar. Yes? Um, Reverend Sir, there's a Well, one specific effect was that once Perlimo had succeeded in throwing out the Portuguese, the black students in South Africa who cannot hold meetings to discuss liberation in South Africa as a crime, but they organized meetings to celebrate the victory of Perlimo in Mozambique, which was a kind of oblique way of making a statement about their own country. These meetings were banned before they took place. It became a crime to have the police in an order, no meeting. But what the police did, as they often did, was uh, something rather clumsy. They knew all the places where the meetings were going to take place Durban, Cape Town, Johannesburg, etc. So they issued a series of orders saying, You cannot hold a meeting in. Durban, you cannot hold one in Johannesburg, you cannot hold one in Cape Town. And all the students did was to do what we would probably do. If we were told we couldn't hold a rally on this campus, we might hold it down in Des Moines. So all they did was strip the place of the meeting. Since the law had specified a particular place, you could have it elsewhere, you wouldn't be breaking the law. The police then arrived in the trap with the uh, blood out track of dogs and so on, which they set on the crowd. Students were badly bitten, many of them were badly beaten, over a hundred were arrested in Germany alone, and uh, many of them were jailed subsequently. But to tell you a refinement of the system, one newspaper in South Africa, in Germany, carried a report the day the meeting was due to take place, and it said, the meeting which was scheduled for Durban had been changed to Westville, which is a suburb of Durban. Now, the editor of that paper was charged with a crime of publicizing the change of mission and in that way assisting in the commission of a crime. So you see the refinement to the system that the uh, man who wasn't connected with it should be. He was eventually, no, I think he was fine, but not too good. Anyone else? I think we have time maybe for one more or two, at least two more questions, and then we can be out in the hall and there will be other questions. How does the term of the South Africa legally define the non white or non white? several ways, and I don't think we have time to do them all. One of them is ancestry. If one sixteenth of your descendants, you know, after your great-grandfather, is black or colored or Asian, then you are black. One sixteenth is enough. But the very dangerous one is that any white person can be declared black by observation. And that means that if you go lie on the beach for the sun tan, even if you do skinny dipping or whatever. And white women generally keep a bracelet on. So that however dark they get, they have a little area of white, they can use to show that they're white. And another more dangerous one is that uh, you can be declared black by association. You may be white and all your folks may be white, 
But if you associate with black, you are declared black by association. And this is very clever again, because it ensures that whites are scared to associate with black because they will lose their own brother status in the society. Okay. There are others, but I guess that would be the idea. One more question. Um, there is something um, order to the Thank you. 